with the vision of providing quality education to students of various strata of the society, the founding stone of Tuljaram Chaturchan College Paramati were kept in the year 1962. The college has been formed with the efforts of numerous people. Our society is a religious minority institute and we thrive well with the preamble of Siddhira Nekantan means knowledge from all the dimensions. The college is affiliated to Savitri Bai Phule Pune University. We are willing to empower the youth to skill and the career oriented educational and vocational programs so that he will be full placed for grabbing the opportunities for his career. The college has well qualified team of experienced teaching staff who are always ready to help, assist, guide and motivate the students. Regular meetings are conducted to keep a track of the development of the students and to plan new activities for their goal. Providing various streams of education under one roof makes Tuljaram Chaturchand College a renowned academic institution. With such numerous courses being provided in the college, the administrative department continuously and promptly maintains a smooth flow of activities in a well-managed manner. The college focuses on imparting career-oriented quality education at par with global standard. The senior college offers three streams arts, commerce and science. The college offers 22 different courses for graduation as well as post-graduation in various departments like Geography Department, Psychology Department, Yoga Department, Bachelor of Vocation Program of UGC in two disciplines, Food Processing and Post-Harvest Technology and Journalism and Mass Communication. The college has well-equipped laboratories where students under the guidance of their professors learn and conduct various experiments. The electronics department in the research arena. The botany department had set up their own botanical garden. Well-equipped biology labs. IT department has well-equipped computer lab with Wi-Fi internet facility where students can develop their computer science skills. The classrooms are well designed with projection facilities and the students are encouraged to have better understanding of their subject with friendly interaction with the teachers. The college campus is built with a central library which has a huge setup of numerous books of various streams. Students can access the library and read on various subjects to gain an in-detail knowledge. There is a reading hall adjoined to the library where the students can peacefully study and take note on various topics of their interest. If a student wants to get some additional information on this subject, DC College also provides an internet cafe. The college has a huge auditorium, Jivraj Sabagraha, with all the modern facilities, where around the year, numerous events and functions are conducted for cultural educational growth of the students. Along with academics, 
the college has given equal importance to physical development of the student by providing innumerable sports activities like volleyball for boys and girls kabaddi basketball boxing for boys and girls the college has trained and developed some great sports persons who have won remarkable awards on various national and international platforms the college provides ncc training where the cadets are given basic military training in small arms and parades the cadets are well trained and given preference over normal candidates during selections the officers provide good training and discipline education to the students the nss activities are conducted by the students like street plays to bring awareness in the society plantation construction of bunds and many others and for these activities the college has received various recognition and awards for their contribution towards society since 41 years the college has been organizing a moropant elocution and debating competition every year which is a state level competition the college publishes an annual magazine called aneka to motivate the creative skills of our students by providing a platform where they can publish their poems articles and their opinions yes society prevent karat astana आम्ही एम बी कॉलेजची नवीन बिल्डिंग बनवतो आणि एका इंग्लिश मिडियम स्कूल म्हणून नवीन बिल्डिंग बांधून त्या ठिकाणी सुरुवात केली या ग्रामीण भागामध्ये हे कॉलेज सुरू असताना इथल्या मुलींची निश्चितपणे एक चांगल्या पैकी व्यवस्था झाली किंवा कारण नाही कारण सहसा मुली बाहेरगावी पाठवायला पालक तयार नसतात पण हे कॉलेज सुरू झाले म्हणजे त्या मुलींना चांगल्या एक शिक्षणाचं दारुण उपलब्ध करून देण्यासारखं होईल The college also fulfills its social responsibility by conducting various events of awareness and confidence building in women and to build a healthy environment it also conducts the activity of plantation The institute has also received various government funds for its welfare and further development Our institute is net reaccredited with a big Also, we have undergone ISO certification 9001. The college has received the funding for DST physics program. The institute is recipient of star college status from DBT. The college has also got various funds like college with potential for excellence, and has won many recognition and awards. in various fields we are seeking that the student should be at the excellence at par not only in academics but in other activities like sports competitive career as well as the vocational skills Teaching department over here is very much friendly. We have a library which includes books from all the schools. We have achieved many prizes uh, of national and state level. The college has uh, boosted our confidence. The computer science department of a college has well equipped laboratory. The teaching staff here is good at transforming student attitude and creating better individuals. The days are not far ahead that this institute will be a benchmark not only in Maharashtra or India. but this is the journey of tuljaram chaturchand college where it has enriched and nurtured hidden talent of students from various strata of the society and transformed them into confident and responsible citizens to excel in all walks of life Hello good morning and a warm welcome to everyone 
I, Professor Sandesh Rathod, welcome all for this international webinar on interdisciplinary analysis of post-COVID world order system. The world as we knew it has changed forever after COVID pandemic was declared on 10th of March 2020. Now we live in an age known as post-COVID. Keeping this status quo in mind, this webinar has been organized by the Department of Political Science, Anekant Education Societies, Tulsaram Chaturchanda College of Arts, Science and Commerce, Baramati, District Pune, Maharashtra, India. And now, Dr. Chandrasekhar Murumkar, the principal of the college and convener of this webinar, will present his address. Thank you, sir, for your confident address. Thank you. Now, I request Dr. Hanuman Patak, the HOD and Organizing Secretary of this webinar, to give an introduction. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Hanuman Patak, Head of the Department of Political Science. I am Organizing Secretary of this international webinar. Before we begin this webinar, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you who sincerely committed to, the, to this event to make it a success. It is a pleasure to welcome everyone that, that is all representatives of this webinar. Participants from the every parts of the India and some participants from the globe. I also welcome Dr. Chandrasekhar Mohankar sir, principal of the uh, of principal in Baramati and Dr. Ajit Telwe, vice principal and Rutha College coordinator. Department of Political Science is coming with an inception of the college in June 1966 and run UDG and TV courses. The department has a legacy of eminent political thinker and several alumni have been filling prestigious positions in various social and political organizations. Moreover, the department also runs in different add-on courses, including UGC approved certificate course in human rights. Department is, is also known for various student centric activities as well as research works carried out, carried out by faculty and published in national and international journals and books. For this international webinar on post world work system, we have research persons like my friend Dr. Mubai Olega, uh, assistant professor, Department of Religious Studies, California State University, Florida, US, America. Dr. Patan, Professor Amritaj of Philosophy and Religion, Guinea Vista University, US America. Dr. Nirajan Kaur Khasta, Baker, Senior Instructor, Theological Studies, uh, Laila Nyam, University, US America. Dr. Margaret Gore, Mary, uh, Assistant Professor, Religious Studies and Theology. St. Mary College, America. Uh, Dr. Sailendra Devarantra, Associate Professor, Government Vidarbha Institute of Science and Humanity, Government College, Amravati, and he is also former Joint Director, Harris Higher Education, Government of Maharashtra. Dr. Mahadeo Bhavani, Principal, Rajarshi Shahu Mahavidyalaya, Rathur, Dr. Manish Navarade, Assistant Professor, Center for International Politics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Dr. Jasmeet Bhava, HOD and Assistant Professor, Central University of Himachal Pradesh, Dharamshala. Uh, it, it is a glorious moment to extend my warm message on behalf of the Political Science Department of PC College Baran. I want to convey my heartfelt gratitude to the management of Anekan Education Society, Principal Dr. Chandrasekhar Mohanpatta, all Vice Principal, Teaching Fraternity, and my colleagues 
for all kinds of support and motivation. Without their encouragement, it would turn out uh, possible. So thank you very much for being with us and uh, hope that this intellectual deliberation will be fruitful. Thank you once again and enjoy this two days, uh, two days international webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's my pleasure that today Department of Political Science is organizing an international webinar on a very vital topic in today's socio-economic concern that is interdisciplinary analysis of post-COVID world order system. Dear friends, globally, after almost one year of COVID impact, when we disorganized, disoriented and shattered in every way of social infrastructure, the time has come where we are gathering our states together and the COVID has impacted almost an individual at his personal level, at his family level, at social level, even at the national level and an impact at global level. And because of that, the Department of Political Science felt it's worthwhile to have a thorough discussion, interaction and a common platform of understanding for the post-COVID new world order system. Well, this particular issue, this particular approach has to be seen almost from every angle. And so I feel that this webinar is justifying its interdisciplinary approach. I'm very much happy and congratulate Dr. Hanwant Fatak sir, who is head of the department and Dr. Kailash Mante, who have taken pains and efforts to select such a vital topic for international discussion and taken pains to bring all you people together. Well, the people like you who are of same minds, attitudes and approach definitely will share their views, ideas and experiences which can give us a new impetus in what can be done, what should be done and how it should be done for not only present day order but for the futuristic approach what we are going to give to the next generation. Dear friends, this post-COVID impact, it has impacted as I told you rightly, each and every individual, but it has hampered and disturbed, distracted the political system as well. This impact was very much severe on social cohesion because from political point of view, the priorities changed. From political point of view, at the national level, when we talk together, at the global level, when we talk together, it was discussing its impact through dropped GDP at each every nook and corner, hampered industry. A major problem which has come up was inflation and unemployability, obviously leading to a very severely damaged economics. Well, this has led 
a compulsion to change the priorities at the political system level. Dear friends, one of the major impact which we have seen today is the impact of increased crime and also political aggressiveness. If we see the world today, you can realize that each and every political system, each and every nation is trying to sustain and they feel that this sustenance is only can come through by forcing oneself ahead, forcing oneself in front and so that they are taking not only the strong hands but they are taking along with them the mean minds also. And so because of that an overall impact of this total post-COVID system has to be analyzed from different angles. One of the major angle, dear friends, that what the corona has brought to us? Well, it has changed the priority of the world. It has changed the priority of UNESCO. And it has changed the priority of UNO itself. The groupings which were present together, either it may be G7, G23, NATO and many and many others. They have changed the priorities. Obviously, they were coming together for strengthening the force enforcement of their strengths and obviously to capture the market at the global level. But at the UNO level and UNESCO level, the unified approach has changed with a priority which is standing alone and in front and that is the healthcare. Yes, the whole world after post-COVID era is fighting for the healthcare all over the world. And each and every one is contributing through their small efforts to make this possible, to make this impossible in a corrective measure so that they can again go ahead with adjusting their economic growth and strength. Furthermore, not only that, this corona has brought in front again one more issue that there is a strong urge of social cohesion because last year each and everyone has faced the social unrest. The social unrest has created so many social problems because of the psychological impact at the individual level, at the family level, at the social level and even at the national level. We have seen that particularly because of the COVID, many had to leave their job, many have become bankrupt and also there was a great strain on their social relationships. There was a great strain on their bondings and because of that again, this is giving us a very strong loud shout to come together under the heading of social cohesion. Such a type of interdisciplinary approach is definitely give us an opportunity to analyze what this COVID era has taught us, what this COVID era is bringing us in front of us to see, to visualize, to analyze, to understand and not only to understand but to follow also. And when we are supposed to follow, dear friends, I do agree that this particular new world order system is almost touching each and every social aspect from the political frame, from economic frame, from social frame, from commercial frame and even at the social psychological frame. Dear friends, I am very much happy that this international webinar is being honored by eminent personalities from all over the world. To quote few, we have got with us Dr. Mugda Yewleka, who is the Assistant Professor, Department of Religious Studies, California State University, America. Dr. Swasti Bhattacharya, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy and Religion, Buinia Vista University, America. Dr. Niranjan Kaur Khalsa Baker, a senior instructor, 
theological studies loyola marymount university america dr margaret goa assistant professor religious studies and theology st mary's college america and also we are having the reputed personalities from the national level also and to mention few dr jagmit bawa who is the head of the department of central university of himachal pradesh dharamshala dr manish dabade center for international politics jawarla nehru university new delhi dr shailendra devlankar from vidarbha institute of science and humanities government college amravati and dr mahadev gavane who is the principal of rajeshri shahu mahavidyalay latu i do agree dear friends that all these personalities who are working in the field of socio political sciences in last several decades they are going to throw more light more impetus on what has changed how it has changed and what can be its impact on coming generations but definitely when we talk about the new world order dear friends the time has come where we have to define the new normal social order so what can be this new normal social order dear friends this new normal social order will be for communal harmony we are talking about the mankind through mutual social cohesion using the political wisdom now the day have come we have to reframe ourselves from the obstacles the problems the issues and the tasks which we do not share together but let's come together join the hands for the betterment of mankind because if we stand tall together then only we can overcome this corona pandemic and i must thank this corona impact in one way that it has again taught us and it has again realized us the importance of social cohesion again it has highlighted and watermarked the importance of brotherhood and also it has given us a way it has shown us a path it has pioneered us to go ahead for the betterment of mankind and that's why dear friends i feel the time has come where let's come together to unite for the survival of mankind through the unified global approach this unified global approach dear friends should stand at the individual level at the family background level at the social level at the national level and also yes at the global level we are all we are all together and that's why this post covid world order is strongly shouting towards us saying towards us that the days have come where we are supposed to change our political program we have to modify we have to revise we have to reframe our political program and we have to see that there is an urgent need to value based strengthening of human relations and that's why i feel that such a type of interdisciplinary analysis of today's new world order is going to give us a new path to pave our head to see the betterment of mankind such a type of seminars definitely are going to give us a new boost new moral to come together under a common single hood that we are all brothers and sisters together and yes i must congratulate again the head of the department dr hanuman patak and his colleague and associate dr kailash mante for taking this adventurous issue in front line for discussion i wish all the best for this international webinar on a very important and timely arranged topic of discussion 
international relations and interdisciplinary analysis of post covid world order system i am sure that within these two days each and every one will be going through the brainstorming sessions churning their views and ideas again testing analyzing and coming through the new experiences of what they have experienced before and definitely they will come out in the clear wind with a clear water and a clear vision what to be done what should be done and what ought to be has to be done i wish all the best all the success and have a great day to each and every one of you stay safe stay cool enjoy and definitely come together and stand in each and every one's front to again hold the shoulders and prove that yes at the beginning we were together today we are together and will be going ahead our next path of journey towards success towards survival again together i wish you all a best of luck thank you have a great day thank you patak sir for your brief introduction and now it is time that we all have been waiting for the first speaker is dr mukta yevlekar and she will speak on what is religious studies relevance of religious studies in humanities and social sciences please let me introduce dr yevlekar she has a phd in religious studies from arizona state university and is an assistant professor at california state university at fullerton religious studies she has published and presented numerous papers in usa india china israel uk and thailand she has a number of awards and honors to her name which includes productive online writing with accountability program dr yovle has received many grants and has recently worked as a member of steering committee interreligious friendship seminar american academy of religion this is dr mukdha yevlekar who will deliver her speech now hello everyone i am very happy to be with you all today my name is uh, dr mukdha yevlekar and i am speaking to you from california state university at fullerton which is uh, located in los angeles um i really want to thank uh, tulsaram chaturchand college for organizing this very timely uh, webinar my association with uh, tc college actually goes back uh, to a couple of decades i vividly remember uh, participating in one of the most prestigious elocution competitions in maharashtra as an undergrad student and you all know which one i'm talking about it's the moropant competition yes uh i remember that year we had won trophies in all three categories and i also remember a very fond memories of the wonderful hospitality that we had received from tc college so i'm very glad to be uh, back with you all and i'm very happy that i'm able to uh, connect with the tc college uh, audience and uh, academicians in this way i had promised that day when i left baramati the last time that i want to come back and uh, do something in this college i wish it was in person but nonetheless we are all here together in this way i want to thank uh, dr morumkar and dr hanumant patak uh, to make this um, dream uh, of mine uh, come true um, apart from my personal joy of speaking with you all today i am especially happy to participate in this webinar as a scholar of humanities the pandemic has changed um, the world in a very radical way we have found new ways of connecting and new ways of building bridges of knowledge across the globe in this new world order in this webinar i along with our three uh, religious studies scholars from usa 
from America, we will introduce our, our audience to the academic discipline of religious studies. We urge students of uh, humanities and social sciences, in fact, even of linguistics, uh, to develop an interdisciplinary framework of mind uh, for effective scholarship of uh, uh, effective scholarship of social and human phenomena. So, with this uh, preliminary introductory remarks, I now uh, want to proceed to my uh, talk for today, and I have titled it as "What is Religious Studies." relevance of religious studies in humanities and social sciences. What I want to talk about today, uh, I have uh, tried to outline it uh, so that uh, our audience get, gets acquainted. So I want to talk about who am I and why am I doing this today? What is my academic training? So, and then I want to do a quick introduction to this seminar. Uh, and then I want to focus on why study religion. What is the importance of studying religion today? Then I want to proceed to talk about what is religious studies, teaching religion versus teaching about religion. I will also do a quick survey of history of the development of religious studies and talk about critiques of religious studies as a discipline there. Then I want to focus on various methodological approaches uh, in the study of religion. And uh, what is it that scholars of religion actually do? That's what I want to talk about. So here I'll be talking about various big questions that are handled in the study of religion. And finally, I will conclude with some insights um, uh, about uh, social sciences and humanities students. Uh, I'm very much aware that we don't have many religious studies uh, departments in India, but we study religion in other departments. So as my listeners who are, I know I'm aware that they are from different social, uh, social sciences, they're studying different social sciences, political science, sociology, um, and they're also perhaps studying languages at the same time. I want us all to think together how we can connect the dots and uh, learn more about um, uh, learn more about society as a phenomenon as we make these wonderful connections uh, by uh, and also learn to use the lens of religion and religious studies, especially not religion, but religious studies as a discipline. Uh, to, to learn about society. So that's what we are going to do um, in short. So I want to begin uh, by making brief remarks about my positionality and who I am and why uh, I decided to uh, pursue my education in religious studies at Arizona State University. Um, I studied political science in SP college, then I, I did my master's in University of Pune, and then I went to the University of British Columbia, where uh, I also did another master's in political science. So for the most part, I focused on philosophy and political science. Uh, in my education in University of Pune, um, I was I, I was I, fo I focused on understanding political thinkers, history of, of formation of political systems in India uh, and international relations. And in University of British Columbia, I studied various things such as um, you know ethnic conflicts around the world and what is the role of religion in uh, in that. Um, so I learned about Irish conflict, for instance, I remember, or, uh, or we were uh, talking a lot about how religion incites violence in different parts of the country. We studied about uh, how the Spanish uh, colonial missions went around the world and uh, it, uh, they, uh, they, they formed their governments and also they took control of the political power. But through that, how they also, in some ways, uh, use religion to influence the uh, uh, the mind of the common people in those countries. So 
big questions about colonialism, role of religion, and so on started coming up. Uh, when I was studying at University of Pune, uh, as uh, many of you know, the Department of Political Science there is wonderful. And we studied about uh, caste and politics in India. Uh, we learned uh, and re read Paul Brass and so many of wonderful uh, scholars, Rajni Kothari, I'm sure some of you are still studying those foundational thinkers of uh, um, modern scholars of political systems. The big question that I was really uh, talking about dealing with and that kind of stayed with me for a long time was about Dalit politics and uh, the Dalit movement. I was really attracted and really engaged in learning how the uh, political process and social processes, how they are uh, very much entangled. And I was keen on studying and actually I wanted to become activist at that point. As I was studying this Dalit movement, I was also doing another bachelor's um, and that was my bachelor's in Sanskrit and Indology from Tirak Maharashtra Vidyapit in Pune. Here I was studying syntax of languages, Vedic literature, uh, theories and semantics uh, of Nirupta and uh, wonderful kavyas like Shakuntal uh, and so on. As a scholar, it was interesting. I wasn't able to make uh, really good connections between all the things that I was learning at that time. But as I advanced in my studies, I started asking questions like, is there any connection between Vedic religion and Dalit movement? What am I studying in my Sanskrit and Indology classes? And what, I, what am I studying in political science classes? Is there a way to connect? Is there... Um, are, are there any theories of language and power? And this is how slowly I started getting attracted to Foucault, as uh, you you might have guessed. But I was I was quite overwhelmed, to be frank with you, at that time. How do I make these connections? And uh, uh, and how do I how do I connect the dots? This was my big kind of query at the time as a budding scholar. I was, like I said, I was quite overwhelmed. How long can I keep language studies, linguistic studies away from political science? Is there a politics of language? What are the intricate issues in the study of language and power? This kind of theoretical development in my mind was forcing me to connect the dots in one way or the other. And finally, I found my home and this was religious studies. Religious studies enabled me to join the dots, to look at some social phenomena uh, from various disciplinary angles at once. And thus began my work uh, in religious studies. I uh, did my uh, doctorate uh, with Dr. Ann Feldhaus at Arizona State University and title of my PhD dissertation was Guru Charitra Parayan, Social Practice of Religious Reading. Here, I combined uh, anthropology and linguistics and critical theory, literary theory, so many of the different approaches and took an interdisciplinary approach uh, towards understanding is uh, the big question there was, is religious reading different from uh, reading in general? How do people who are reading in a religious way, how do they make meaning of the text? Is the idea of text different as they are reading it? And to find out this, at first I conducted a lot of research about religious reading in various uh, religious traditions. For instance, people read Torah. In Judaism, people read uh, Bible uh, uh, in a practice called as Lectio Divina. And people read Guru Granth Sahib uh, in, in Sikhism. So, and, and people read Guru Charitra, for instance, uh, from the beginning till end in Maharashtra over a period of seven days, sometimes three days, sometimes two and a half. I met with so many people and they had all, uh, they all shared their own algorithms about how many chapters they read each day and how much time and how do they prepare and all of that. So uh, what I did was I started studying about this phenomenon within uh, religion, which is the phenomenon of religious reading. This is a very interesting phenomenon because you are reading a text at the same time. 
uh, as you're doing the ritual process. Ritual process, what do I mean by that? That some people sit in particular way in a cross-legged position, or they will take shower before starting the reading practice, or they would not read even newspaper or social media, uh, they will not expose themselves to anything outside, but they will just do a meditation as they read. So many people, as they are reading during those times, uh, they would not wear certain objects such as uh, objects made from leather, or uh, they would just stop eating meat, for instance, or they would not travel outside of their town, uh, or uh, and, and so on and so forth. So what I realized is that it's not just about reading that particular text, but it's also about the praxis, the practice that goes around the reading process. So does that add any meaning to uh, how people read? And what do they, why do they do that? And how do they explain the meaning of the text, the Guru Charitra, the stories, the narratives from each of those chapters and how do they connect their religious behavior, their ritual process in the context of Guru Charitra? Do they begin with certain uh, ritual process? Do they end with certain process? All these kinds of questions came up. For that, I went to India and stayed there for one year, one year and interviewed about 250 people who uh, read uh, Guru Charitra in a Parayan manner. So I traveled in various cities in Maharashtra. I was in Nashik and Dindori, and I was in Akkalkot, and I was in uh, Gangapur, in Narsobachiwadi, Kolhapur, all these places I traveled, I interviewed people. Then I came back to the US and uh, transcribed. That means I actually typed each word from the interview that I had done. And then using softwares and using my own uh, analysis, I tried to come up with common recurring themes in these uh, conversations about Parayan, about social praxis, about religious reading. Then I went back to my earlier research about what, uh, what is the idea of religious reading in different religious traditions, in Judaism, in Christianity, in uh, Sikhism, in Hinduism, and so on, like Bhagavad Parayan for that matter. What have other scholars written about this topic? I tried to go back to my notes and anal analyzed what have other scholars done in this context. And then I went back to my notes from my ethnographic notes, that is my anthropological work, the way I interviewed people. What is it that I got from those interviews? So I then placed things side by side and then tried to come up with my own observations about the process of religious reading. So the reason to go into details about religious reading or my dissertation and the way I conducted research is to give you a glimpse of how scholars study in uh, religious studies. And this is one example of that. that. Uh, you will see more examples of the same, of the same meaning of how people study religion in a systematic manner uh, from the four scholars, I mean, three other than myself um, uh, from uh, in, in this webinar, in this international webinar. And the big questions uh, there would, would be, what is religious studies and how do you study religion from different angles? We have Dr. Swasti Bhattacharya who would be speaking about uh, Vinoba Bhave, Sarvoda and cultural humility. Uh, she would look at what religious studies looks like from ethics angle. Then we have a Dr. Niranjan Kaur Khalsa Baker, who is going to talk to us about teaching Sikhism and Jainism in Los Angeles or outside of India for that matter. How do you teach comparative religion? How do you compare religions and how do you teach about that? That's what she would talk about. Then we have Dr. Margaret Gower, who will be talking to us about theology and religion. And she would be talking to us about how do you study religion from different angles? What if you are, what you belong, what if you belong to one religion? How do you study other religions from uh, that perspective where you are, you belong to one religion? 
and uh, and that would be uh, the 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 conclusive uh, remark on of, on this uh, from from this part of the international webinar. So collectively, we want to introduce you to religious studies as a discipline and how we have been studying uh, religion in a systematic way, in an academic way, in a non-judgmental way. Um, and how uh, for for last, I would say more than twenty years now. How has that happened? What have we done in India? What have we done in America? All of that will come as we talk about uh, religious studies as a discipline. So after this brief introduction to my own journey and reflecting a bit on the purpose of this seminar, I now turn to a foundational question. Why do we need to study religion in the first place, right? And here I have listed some uh, you know, reasons that I uh, think are important. They're, they're not really exhaustive. They're not all of them, but I still try to give you some of the big ideas, big brushstrokes, big brushstrokes. So first is for a well-rounded education, right? Study about religion gives us access to people's core values about life and lifestyles. It makes students well-rounded citizens. It is very common uh, now to find people marrying to someone who belongs to a religion other than their own. I remember, uh, uh, you know, uh, seeing that uh, that kind of phenomenon was like a big deal uh, growing up, but now it's very common in India for that matter. Well, beyond that, I mean, of course, if it's a cross uh, religious marriage, then you want to understand the other person or understand the other family. We just had a big controversy about Tanishka ad, I believe, and then, you know, to understand the content of such ads for that matter, we need to study uh, uh, the, the religious processes and religion very, very uh, clearly. What is, what is the problem with that ad? We need to be critically thinking about uh, those kinds of uh, issues. But I think there is also a deeper reason, and, and, and that's why I'm using the word well-rounded education there. And the deeper reason is, I remember when there was, um, after 9-11 in the US, there was an attack on members of, uh, some members of the Sikh community. And unfortunately, the members of Sikh community were misinterpreted uh, uh, or mistaken to be Muslims. Uh, now the problem here is twofold, right? One, that not all Muslims are violent and religion of Islam is not a, um, is not a violent religion, just like religion, any other religion, right? So have we studied that? So there's that problem, but there is also another problem. Does, does everyone who has beard, uh, you know, is, is everyone who has beard a Muslim? So there is a double kind of misunderstanding and that's where this idea of religious illiteracy became very uh, important to address in the popular education, in the higher education. And I think this is very inter interesting, uh, you know, not only for US, but also for India, you know. I was traveling a couple of years ago with my friend uh, from US uh, in Rajasthan, and I vividly remember um, they were, uh, uh, everybody who was talking to her, they were referring to her as uh, somebody who's from British of British woman. Well, she was not British, she was American to start with. And then they were, they assumed that she is Christian. She was not Christian, she was Jewish. So in short, what I'm trying to get at is that we need religious literacy to understand nuances of people's religious identities. We need to study religion seriously to understand history because religion is a force of history. Portuguese came to Goa in the 16th century and changed the idea of religion and the region for that matter forever. When we visit uh, the church of Our Lady of Velankani in uh, Chennai, we see that the worship that people offer to her looks like Hindu puja in many ways, right? This syncretic development is really important to understand because religion has shaped particular uh, uh, many geographical regions and not just shape, but also you see several syncretic processes happening at the same time. When we traveled to Peru and saw how Catholics uh, who settled there 
uh, from 16th century adopted the local go goddess and, uh, face and her facial features uh, of the, the, the goddess of the Incan civilization, I mean. And they depicted uh, Mary using those uh, features. We realized that re religion is a very important force in shaping history and in shaping, shaping people's popular culture, in shaping uh, people's ideas about who they are, right? So we need to study uh, religion very seriously in an academic way to, to understand and appreciate other cultures. Um, because study of religion teaches us about diversity. It teaches of us how we are different yet interconnected. I uh, traveled to Macau, China a few years ago, and I was walking on the streets and I kept thinking and re I was constantly reminded of Go Goa. Then I went back and I studied uh, the history of the place, Macau. And no wonder I realized that the same Portuguese that developed Goa developed Macau. So on the streets, I saw, saw those cobblestones for that ma matter, or the forts that we saw there were so similar to. Uh, so, uh, so the Portuguese, the Catholic Portuguese that came to Goa, the missionaries, the same people, they went to Macau at that time. So the study of religions and travels of religious people can teach us so much about uh, commodities and commonalities across cultures. Religion is a force in everyday life. When I use the word everyday, I mean religion is a force in some ways that shapes our dressing, the way we sit, the way we fold our legs, the way we eat, the way we uh, serve food to people, uh, right? The way we treat our uh, guests. Uh, I am just going to give a very interesting example here, right? We all, uh, especially in Maharashtra, we use the word batata. And this is a word we use uh, for potato, potato, right? So potato is actually a word that, or batata is a word that comes from Portuguese, right? Potato was first used by the Incas of Peru, a South American uh, country, right? Around 2500 BCE. The Spanish Catholics fell in love with it when they settled in Peru in the 16th, 17th century. And they brought it back to Spain first. And from Spain, then that potato got introduced to Europe. Now, these uh, some of the missionaries, the Portuguese missionaries that I just mentioned when I was talking about Goa, when they traveled to Goa, they brought it to Goa and other places in India. And that's how we all got introduced to potato. So what I'm trying to get at is that we can see how the world is connected through religion and travels uh, surrounding to religion. Now, if we study religion in a systematic way, then and, and especially history and religious history, then we can learn so much about ourselves in this way. So far, so good. We have talked about history. Let's talk about present a little bit. Look at how our realities across the globe are today. You are sitting somewhere in Baramati and I'm sitting somewhere in Los Angeles and we are connecting, we are talking to each other. Look at uh, the job market around you, right? I think that study of religion is even more relevant in contemporary times. We are so well connected by internet. Anyone can work from almost anywhere in the world today. In this work environment, uh, we need to understand what our colleagues value why they care about particular things, um, what are their ethics and moralities and how they're shaped. And religion proves to be a key uh, a direct and indirect force in shaping people's values, people's uh, behaviors, people's uh, uh, way of work sometimes. Uh, here I'm reminded of Max Weber's uh, uh, work on Protestant, uh, 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 Protestant religion and or Protestant ethic, as he calls it, and how that's connected to economics. So anyways, to de religion is, uh, or study of religion is also needed to deal with these new, new realities of uh, market, as well as immigration patterns. People are moving uh, to anywhere in the world, right? And that's why it's important to study, uh, you know, uh, 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 people across the globe in a very systematic way now, and religion provides one such lens. Finally, all is good so far. 
we look around and we realize there are so many conflicts arising in the name of violence or there is religious violence per se. So one of the ways to understand about the reasons of violence and is to is to actually conduct uh, the the idea, uh, conduct the research about religion. If we uh, take uh, the idea of religious war or holy war, it is very different we have had that in many, many religions, in Sikhism or even in Gita to, an, to a certain extent, we have um, reference to idea of protecting uh, the civil society. And for that, the idea of just war or just war theory for that matter. So in all, uh, study of religion is relevant and uh, in, to, to make us a better citizen, to create a good civil society and to understand our contemporary job market, our immigration patterns, and to connect with the world at once. So those are uh, some of the big uh, brush strokes. Like I said, we can go on and on, and this could be an entire topic of conversation. But in what follows, I want to actually talk about how do scholars of religion actually study religion? What are their big questions that they are presenting uh, or that they are analyzing as they study. So I'll give you a brief idea about the, uh, the big questions and then the methods that scholars of religion use to study, uh, uh, to study in, in the, in the uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary discipline of religious studies. So that's what we will do for rest of the time. So the big question would be, what is religious studies and how did it all start? So it's a contemporary academic field of scholarship that examines and interprets religion and religions from a wide range of perspectives. So it's academic study of various religions in context of their history, beliefs and practices. What makes this study academic is the disposition of scholars. The aim of this study uh, the, the aim um, is to study religion from a non-judgmental, bias-free perspective. Now, there might be questions such as, you know, is there a bias-free perspective, bias-free study possible in social sciences and humanities? And of course, uh, bias-free study is not possible. When I went to Guru uh, and studied Guru Charitra Parayan, I was denied access to several places because I am a woman. So, of course, my perspective and understanding about those places which I had limited access to was based on my uh, biases um, about not getting access, for instance. Or uh, uh, sometimes people commented or called me that, you know, you will face bad consequences because you're reading Guru Charitra, right? So, you know, I had certain reflections and certain reactions to such uh, harsh comments. So, of course, when I wrote, when I interviewed those people who were highly critical about my work, I had my own biases. So, bias-free study is not always possible. I am from India. I grew up in India. So, there is that positionality. And therefore, my uh, range of questions about topic was very different from, let's say, if an um, American person who had, uh, who grew up here in Los Angeles went and suddenly started observing people from India. It's going to be very different, the perspective, the understanding, understanding and the range of questions. So yeah, bias-free perspective, is it possible or not? That's a question. However, one can always develop a habit, and this is an intellectual habit of self-reflexivity. One can ask, what are the kinds of biases that I am bringing in the fieldwork, that I'm bringing as a analyze as I write. So religious studies uh, invites you to conduct bias-free uh, and self-reflexive study uh, of uh, religion, right? Uh, there must be, of course, commitment to openness, to understanding other people with empathy and uh, to, understand, to understanding difference. As I will mention briefly, when I talk about critiques of religious studies, uh, as a discipline, we will uh, refer to some of the issues in the early uh, development of the discipline and especially the issues related to difference. Uh, there are many ways of studying religion uh, in a systematic way, in an academic way. 
one can simply observe and describe phenomenon one can compare different religions one can examine the function of religion in a particular society or one can just interpret scriptures or written uh, literature or rituals of a particular religion so there are various ways of studying religion in a systematic way here i want to briefly um, talk about how the study of religion began in the west especially uh, it's a 19th century origin uh, of the field well before 19th century as the colonial powers started going to places around the world and as they started observing um, uh, various uh, people worshipping their divinity or their ideas of God being very, very different from their own, meaning Protestant or Catholic uh, 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 ideas about divinity. So that's when the natural query began. But that, that goes back then to 15th, 16th centuries, like Portuguese going to Goa and all of that, remember? Or uh you know catholics going to incan spanish going to the incan civilization and things like that but at that time you don't have religious studies as a systematic discipline what you have is people writing travelogues and people passerbys writing about uh, rituals and things like that in the in the beginning of 19th century though you have systematic uh, development somewhat systematic development of study of religious studies. So here you have people like Max Mueller uh, and uh, you know and 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 so on who are not, not not traveled so much to India, not traveled to India and other places from far away because remember travel was very limited at the time. But they were bringing back or getting access to written literature from around the world, scriptures from around the world, and that's how you see uh, Max Mueller getting all over uh, you know the vedic uh, uh, writings for that matter. i mean vedic literature for that matter however i wonder if max muller had realized that vedas were ne never written down they were passed down orally to study that kind of thing he would have to travel in india right or to meet with real people but that was not happening at the beginning of 19th century people were still sitting in their uh, corners uh, and their armchairs uh in oxford and cambridge and so on and they were trying to get get access to scriptures around the world and learn about what is religion to these people remember in those times the focal point of analysis was how is this religion different the religion at hand how is their idea of god different from christianity so catholic traditions or protestant traditions were the um were the main focus and the others were coming in comparison and of course that then led to several problems which we will talk about a uh, little bit later now after this brief uh, you know period uh, of a study of uh, religion the very beginning of study of religion in a systematic way you see a full fledged development of what we call as area studies departments in 1950s and 60s in uh, various uh, universities in North America. And there you find people going and staying in, uh, you know, uh, in various places such as uh, countries in Africa or in India or Australia and studying uh, and, and then living there for a for, uh, for number of years, 10 years, 12 years, like you have uh, uh, Victor Turner, who uh, studied about pilgrimages, uh, and he also commented uh, about our uh, Vitobas, um, you know, Pandarpur Chivari at the same time as Iravati Karve was writing or studying it. So it's interesting, you know, how scholarship in, across the globe, although they were not so connected at the time, developed at the same time. Well, so my point was with the development of area studies, people started going and staying in places across the globe for longer time. And that's when the idea that religion is part of one, one way or one um, you know, angle, one element in the study of social, uh, uh, in, in the study of society in general came into picture. And that's when you start uh, seeing scholars writing about the overall cultural system 
and their religion as a part of it. Eventually, you have people like Clifford Geertz uh, writing about religion as one lens to study society and so on. And that's when we have uh, all these, um, you know, study about uh, anthropology, you know, going to, for instance, Clifford Geertz writes about cock fight, fights about cocks in Indonesia, wonderful essay. Um, and uh, he writes about what these people do um, and uh, and how this simple ritual or rather simple celebration of a, a fight about cocks can be uh, very meaningful to the lives of people in Indonesia in, in a very big way that if you were just traveling for two days and observe, you would never understand. That's where people start writing about, well, everybody hears pop music or you know, there is a drums in um, or tom tom as a rhythm in African music, but it's not just the music, it's not just the rhythm, but there is a meaning, there's a symbolic meaning uh, to that type of rhythm or beats. So this kind of understanding religion uh, from various perspective and from a lived tradition uh, begins in early 60s and it then uh, develops uh, by the end of 60s and that's how um, that's how you have uh, development and evolution of religious studies as a discipline in various north american uh, universities this is where then in 1980s we are fast forwarding by a few years 1980s and 90s you have so many people going to uh, places around the world uh, you have ann gold uh, who studies uh, you know rajasthan and songs of Rajasthani women, for that matter. You have Anne Feldhaus, who studies Mahanubhav uh, Sampradaya from Maharashtra for about 40, 50 years by, or, or 30 years by that time. Uh, you have Elizabeth, um, Elinor, El Elinor Zelliet studying a Dalit study, a Dalit uh, movement, and so on and so forth. I can go on and on. But these people by 1980s and 90s, they have been they had been in the field for 30 40 years and that's when they start writing about insider and outsider what if you are an indian studying indian religion what are the limitations what are the advantages what if you are an american studying uh, africa does that shape your uh, uh, does that bring some biases what if you are a woman what if you are a uh, so on and so forth right so this issue of self-reflexivity is bias-free study of religion possible? You know, those kinds of questions, they start coming to the forefront in 1990s. And that's how religious studies develops even more. Uh, so all in all, if we wanted to uh, talk about it, uh, the discipline of religious studies uh, in some ways began as a necessity, as a really, you know, the query about the other, the different, different. But then eventually it develops in a very systematic way. It develops from that simple query of the colonialist, of the early travelers. It develops into a full-fledged field. And there people start getting, uh, you know, uh, going to the field or going to the places around the world and settle down there for ages and then or other years and then study uh, religion. Now, after this brief overview about religious studies and how it evolved and what are the issues and challenges, I want to quickly talk about what are the overarching questions in the study of religion, in a systematic study of religion. So some of the overarching themes or some of the overarching ideas that scholars of religion study are listed here and i'm just going to give brief examples symbols or icons is the other word not idols icons right icon or symbol we are talking about uh, if there is one object we don't look at the object but we are talking about the signifying idea what that uh, what that object represents so the christians when they look at cross for example what does it mean to them, right? Or, uh, or, or so, so the, the cross actually, right? It would remind them of uh, not just the cross, the sign, but it, it, it represents uh, the followers of uh, the, the life of Jesus and who died on a cross and rose on the third day, uh, on the third day. 
So symbols, I'm just giving a quick example here, but what I mean is in every religion you study, uh, you see use of symbols, right? Uh, use of icons, use of symbols. Uh, when Hindus are doing puja to various icons of gods, uh, what are they reminded of? What are they really thinking about? So this is the study of symbols, right? There is a big area, big focus on the study of stories, myths, or narratives. Now, the word myths in religious studies is not used to describe something that is um, untrue, right? We are talking about stories or legends or narratives which tell us um, about how the community, uh, you know, uh, came to be the way it is. So there might be stories, for instance, in um, Islam, there is a story of uh, which is called Miraj, right? How Muhammad traveled from, uh, from um, uh, you know, from, from Arabia to um, the rock, Dome of Rock in Jerusalem overnight. Now, nobody really asks or nobody is really concerned about whether this really happened or not. Or when we are talking about the Govardhan Parvat story of uh, Krishna, we don't really, and, and the Hindus really don't care so much about whether Krishna really uh, uh, hold, uh, was able to hold the Govardhan Parvat in, on his pinky. That's a non-question. So these stories or the myths or the narratives, what are they trying to tell us about the society? How we came together? What did we agree to be as a community? What are the big religious ideas? Okay, so study of stories is a big area there. Then, of course, there is study of rituals. What is ritual? Well, prescribed, routinized behaviors and actions, right? How many priests are sitting around the fire as they conduct the yajna, right? What are the chants that they are doing? Are they doing particular kinds of uh, movements, neck movements, or hand gestures, or you know, hand movements? Are they offering things? Do they mean? Uh, anything as they offer, offer the ghee or some other object to the fire, right? How's the ritual se space set up, right? Are there any preparations before and after? Is anybody taking shower or bath before? Why? Why do they care about taking bath before they uh, do a yajna or any ritual ceremony for that matter, right? Why is it that the Greeks uh, break a glass in the during, during the wedding after their wedding? Right, these kinds of analysis, these kinds of observing, observing people's routinized behavior in religious spaces, and then understanding the meaning behind that. Right, uh, this is the study of rituals. Right, then of course there is study of ethics, and I think Dr. Bhattacharya is going to give us a uh, more a clear idea about how scholars of religion focus on the idea of ethics, okay? And she's going to bring her conversation about prisons and pandemics and vaccination and religion and religious studies, right? Uh, and you will um, enjoy her talk as well. But in general, what are religious studies scholars studying when they study ethics? How does a particular community come up with ideas of good and bad? Uh, what are the punishment, what, what are the punishments they are going to give to, um, uh, you know, uh, for bad actions and what are the rewards for doing good actions, right? I always use a video about African Dogen Dama, a man uh, in that video, a man from Mali who's 29 years old, okay, 29 years old. He's not considered to be adult yet. He's so sad. He's waiting for the community to recognize him as adults, right? So this is, uh, so what are the ethics involved? What does, how does one become a Dogon or, um, you know, in Mali, in Africa? So these are the big questions that the ethics uh, scholars of religion and ethics would pursue. Finally, there might be some scholars who uh, decide to look at the doctrines. How are the doctrines of a particular religion formed? And what does that word mean? Uh, doctrine means big questions about existence, right? What is the nature of this world? Where did we come from? How did how did this universe begin? What is the idea of community, right? Uh, what happens to living beings after they die? What happens to us when we die? Here, our uh, you know, in in Indian religions, there is idea of samsara, samsara, right? Uh, karma, dharma. All these ideas are uh, in the in the 
uh, purview in the area of study of religion as in the in the study of doctrines in the in the with a focus on context of of um, doctrines so i think uh, dr gower's work combines historical uh, approach to development of doctrines in medieval christianity and i think you will get a glimpse of this particular angle of studying religion in her talk so what i want to make sure is that we understand that uh, scholars of religion can either focus on uh, one of these or all of these or some of these, right? But these are the big questions in this academic study of religion. Uh, and, and those are uh, constantly, of course, evolving. Now, I want to note that there are many, many methodological approaches to study religion in a systematic manner. So there is a phenomenological approach, philological approach, psychological, historical, sociological, anthropological. And these are just to name a few. We don't have time to go on and uh, talk about each and every approach, uh, but I will briefly talk about each um, approach. So like I said, the first uh, approach, the oldest in some ways is the phenomen phenomenological approach. Uh, where uh, you see the big idea being religion is an irreducible phenomenon that exists transculturally and transhistorically. So this is the big idea there. And so that then leads to comparative and experiential approach to study of religion, right? There are many scholars of this approach and I've listed them here. There's a philological approach and uh, the big idea there being using religious texts and Max Mueller, I give you give you one example using religious texts to understand religious processes right so this is another approach what does a sentence mean by by not just looking and so critical edition of mahabharata uh, was i think prepared by bhandarkar institute in pune a few years ago and that's where you see the philological approach at work in the study of i'm sure a lot of you have studied emil Durkheim, Max Weber, uh, Karl Marx. So some of the names on this slide uh, must be familiar to you all. So sociological approach, right? The big big idea there being religion as a primarily primarily a social phenomenon, right? So we need to study religion seriously to understand how the society functions, what's the role of religion in making or breaking society, and that's where religion, uh, you know, theories about religion are coming from all these uh, scholars. I don't have time to go into details of each of this uh, scholar. Uh, again, psychological approach, the big questions, big idea, meaning uh, how does religion operate in the mind of an individual or a community, right? And how can, and these are newer questions now, how does religion help in healing mind and body? What is the role of religion in uh, pandemics? Is religion helping people cope with the stress that's coming out of the COVID-19 uh, situations across the globe, right? And the study of um, uh, religion from psychological perspective, of course, began from all these scholars like Freud and James and uh, Carl Jung, and everybody took a different perspective, but these are main scholars, important scholars. I hope that as you're listening to my talk and as I, as you're reading these slides, you're also paying attention to all the symbols that are selected uh, from various regions in the world, especially the big world religions. I want to end uh, this conversation uh, by um, giving a brief introduction to anthropological idea, anthropological approach. And like I mentioned earlier, going to places, observing them, and looking at religion as a you know part of a bigger social phenomenon this is the key methodology of anthropological approach so religion although uh, it has no proper place uh, to study in the current academic setting in india uh, in most cases we don't have religious studies departments but what i wanted to show through, through this conversation is that uh, religion is a really important force that shapes history, that shapes our present, and that will shape our future. And so we have to make a systematic understanding of different religions. 
we need to uh, develop our perspective about religious processes as we are studying political science, sociology, Sanskrit, or any language for that matter. We need to undertake the study of, um, you know, interconnectedness very, very seriously. We need to look at it in a very, uh, we, we need to develop a serious commitment to study of uh, these different disciplines and how they are connected to each other. And perhaps religion can provide one very um, important lens to do so. Uh, this is the argument that I have tried to uh, uh, illustrate and talk about throughout my presentation. And I hope that through all the other three present presentations, you will get a similar input, which will be useful for you in your future studies. Good luck and thank you so much uh, for inviting me to talk to you today. And thank you to Zaram Ch Chaturchan College and all the authorities at the college. Thank you, ma'am, for speaking on what is religious studies relevance of religious studies in humanities and social sciences. And we will proceed to the second speaker for today's session, Dr. Swasti Bhattacharya. And the topic of her talk is Vinoba Bhave, Sarvodaya and Cultural Humility, Religious Studies and Ethics. Let me introduce Dr. Bhattacharya. At present, she is Professor of Philosophy and Religion Buna Vista University and has a PhD in religion and social ethics in Christian, Hindu and Jewish religions. She is recipient of George White Excellence in Teaching Award and has a list of grants to her name. She has traveled all over the globe and presented academic papers in many conferences and workshops. Dr. Bhattacharya has published a book named Magical Progeny, Modern Technology, a Hindu Bioethics of Assisted Reproductive Technology. In addition to this, she has also worked as a registered nurse from 1987 to 2001. This is Dr. Swasti Bhattacharya with her speech. Greetings. Good evening. Thank you so much for this invitation to be part of this webinar on highlighting the importance of interdisciplinary research in the midst of COVID. So just in case you're wondering what's on my eye, my eyelid was cut this morning and I'm thankful I didn't need stitches, just a few steri strips for a couple days. Um, so hopefully it won't be too distracting. I've taught philosophy and religion for over 20 years. I have a PhD in religion and social ethics and I'm an ethicist. So that means I explain how we make or I explore, examine how we make decisions. I do this from multiple religious perspectives and worldviews. Ethics and more specifically applied ethics is by nature interdisciplinary. To do bioethics or environmental ethics well or any kind of decision-making process, it's important to understand science and the facts about nature and the decisions that we make need to be grounded in solid research and in knowledge. An example of my work is my book, Magical Progeny, Modern Technology, a Hindu bioethics of assisted reproductive technology. And what I'm doing there is I take elements of Hindu thought and belief, and I bring it into the world of medicine. And the argument is for medical care to be competent, to be good, it needs to be culturally competent and culturally aware, right? A physician needs to understand who they're treating. The central question of what I'm addressing for most of my life has been, how then shall we live? I explicitly ask myself and my students and those around me, who are we? Who do we want to be? And how do we want to live in this world? Now, I've had a, a long-term research project where I began with the desire to learn more about and to write about Vinoba Bhave. He was a disciple, friend, confidant, and spiritual successor to Gandhi. And while many people know Gandhi, very few know about Vinoba. When Gandhi began, began his Satyagraha movement, he selected Vinoba to physically lead it. And at the time, Vinoba was relatively unknown. 
and his re he has remained so because he just didn't seek the spotlight and he, he wasn't into politics and into power. So between 2006 and 2011, I came to India every year and lived there between eight weeks and eight months. And during that time, I conducted over the interviews with over 100 people that spanned three generations. So the older ones that I interviewed were ones who worked with Gandhiji and Vinobhaji. My father was one of them and he knew them and that's how I actually knew many of the people involved. And then it was their children, so my generation, and then people who had kids of that generation. So that's three generations that I was able to interview. And all the people who I talked to, all of them were actively engaged in the Sarvodaya work of Gandhi and Vinoba. Now, Satyagraha is the term that we often hear with Gandhi, but Sarvodaya is often associated with Vinoba. Now, I wanna, if we were live and together in the same room, I would ask how many of you know that term, right? Sarvodaya was a term designed or coined by Gandhi, and then Vinoba developed it as we went along, as he went along. So today, what I wanna do is just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm gonna briefly define Sarvodaya. And if you know what it means, just bear with me. And I'm gonna identify three foundational principles. Then second, I'm gonna connect Sarvodaya to the concept of cultural humility. And that's something I've been working on for about the last nine years. I'll define that and discuss that. And then finally, I'm gonna apply these ideas of Sarvodaya and cultural humility as we think through important issues related to the global pandemic in which we're living right now. So let's begin with Sarvodaya. Sarva, all, right? It means all or wholeness. Udaya means the holistic emergence, right, of everything. And some people talk about how Sarvodaya implies a holistic growth and all round development of all sections of our global humanity. Vinoba says of Sarvodaya, we do not want the rise of a few, not even of the many, nor of the greatest number. We can be satisfied only when the good of one and all, of the high and the low, the strong and the weak, the intelligent as well as the dull. Elsewhere, Vinoba says, oops, it says, the word sarvodaya means that all should rise, should grow, and all includes the lowliest and the last. Now, from this um, idea of sarvodaya, we have three principles that can emerge. And the first is this idea of a genuine acknowledgement of the equality of all humanity, right? It gets at the heart of who counts, who are we thinking about when we make decisions? Whose lives are we considering when we make certain choices? The teachings of Satyagraha, right? Vinoba defines it as nonviolent insistence on truth through love. And I love what he says here. He says, the essence of Satyagraha is to have only good intentions, to persuade the opponent to see your point, to carry on a dialogue patiently, and to discover your own faults in the process. Think about what that implies. What does, what's required if you're gonna be able to only see good in your, I mean, only to have good intentions and see the good in your opponent and see the faults in your own positions, right? That requires humility. And that's really, really important. Now, let's look at how these ideas of Sarvodaya connect with cultural humility. So cultural humility comes out of nursing. I was a nurse for 20, 10 years, a long time ago. And in nursing, we used to talk about cultural competency. And there it was about gaining knowledge and becoming competent, knowing you can master this knowledge. And we'd have an actual checklist, right? And we'd go through it. Once you've checked off all the boxes, you have mastery of that knowledge. You know what you're talking about. And you can say, I'm an expert. The problem is, can anyone really gain mastery over things like religion or culture? And the answer is no, right? Think about in your own families. 
right? How you might have people that you grew up in the same household, but you still see the world differently, or you still respond to things in a different way, or you don't see the world the same way as your brother or your parents or your uncle, right? You can probably imagine situations in the medical field where a physician who believes that they fully understand a religious tradition can actually do more harm than good. Right, because if a patient comes into their house, uh, into their office, and they think, oh, yeah, I know what this person needs, they're going to make assumptions that can lead them to wrong conclusions. So cultural humility, I see it as a different paradigm for learning. So while learning and acquiring knowledge itself is important, but we do that all with an eye toward increasing our capacities to understand one another. Today, it's too often where people are unable to see beyond their own worldview or even acknowledge they have a worldview, that their understanding is a perspective, right? One amongst many, right? To even begin to understand someone else. Cultural humility provides us with many needed skills and things that can be learned and honed and developed. And as we develop these skills, we can better understand the people around us. And this becomes important because if we utilize these tools, they are one of the ways that we can deal with the racial, economic, political, and all these other issues that are tearing our world apart right now. So before I talk about cultural humility, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about the definition of humility itself. Now, humility is a noun. And when you look at this first definition here, the quality of not being proud because you are aware of your bad qualities. So this is one of the reasons why I was not going to actually use humility. When I was developing, you know, I was learning about cultural humility and I was developing my own stuff on it. I was going to change that word and use something else because it just, it was too negative. And my students were responding to it in negative ways. Here's another definition having a low opinion of oneself, or if you do a Google, Google search, a modest or low view of one's own importance, that's humble. Can you see how in all these definitions, there's a negative light, right? Humility is a noun and it has these negative connotations. And I was like, ah, I don't like that. But then I started to do some research and I started reading and writing about how do other people see humility? So you have another author, who looks at this idea of humility and says, no, he, they reject the idea that it's negative and that means you have to have a low view of yourself. Rather, they talk about humility as being on a continuum, right? So there's a, there's a broad spectrum between pride and on the side of pride, you have this perfect, yeah, I'm perfect, I'm narcissistic. You're not open to other ideas because why would you be? Yours are the best. Right, and they only understand my view because there's no reason to understand anybody else. Or on the other side of that, you have humiliation, right? There's no pride, you don't have any worth, right? You feel one or we have no, nothing to offer, you know, society or the world. Well, between those two, this author talks about humility. And so in that sense, humility is a real, little more, has more substance and it's more about this balance right, between having a really high view of yourself and a really low one, but humility is about a balance. Well, I kept digging, and by, by the time I finished digging, I came up with what I'm calling my three-part working definition of humility, and I say working because it's something I'm continually working on, and I keep developing and learning more. So the first part of my definition of humility begins with self-reflection. And when you think about who you are, you have this true understanding. It doesn't require you to have a low regard of yourself. Rather, it requires us not to be enamored, to think we're too good, right, with ourselves. I have to share you this story. So I had been in grad school for many, many years, and I was at USC, and I gave my first lecture. There was 200 students in the class, and I was nervous, and I get up there, and I give it, and it went really, really well, and I was talking about women in Hinduism in India, and then after this class, this young Indian woman comes up to me, and she has tears in her eyes, and she says, thank you for your lecture, and she goes on, and there were situations around that as to why this was so moving for her. 
And so I was so excited. I call home and I'm telling my parents, you know, I, I did this well and it went really well. And you got to remember, I was in grad school for a long time. So I had been working really hard to get to that point. And my dad says something in Sanskrit and then he says, translates it and says, the tree that is full of fruit is low to the ground. And I'm like, okay, fine. You know, I'm not, it's not that I think I'm all that great, but I'm acknowledging that I could do something well. So you need a true reflection of yourself to reflect in yourself, to have an accurate view. And this accurate view leaves you open-minded, right? And you seek out new learning and you're open to learning new things. And then the self-understanding, it's key. But that in itself is not enough because just because you understand yourself isn't the full picture. So the next part of humility that's important is that you have this understanding of yourself within the context of the world around you, right? So humility at its core is the experience of aligning ourselves in relationship to everything else. Humility generates a heightened appreciation of ourselves and for everyone else, right? In the ourselves in the vast complex world in which we are part. And importantly, this shift that we have that's a, away from the focus of ourself does more than just shift away from our needs and interests, more to the needs and interests of others. It involves a reorientation of our relationship to the outside world heightening the importance of keeping things in proper perspective. Humility heightens the intricately interwoven relationships we have with the world. It begins with an accurate view of ourself in the context of relationships with everyone else. So I'm not losing a sense of who I am as I am expanding it. Now that goes to the third element which when I have an understanding of who I am in connection to everyone else, it leads to actions that are grounded in empathy, compassion, and respect. Humility doesn't reduce the force of scope of our own needs and interests. Rather, we realize that we flourish by facilitating and contributing to the flourishing of others. So it's not just us, them, it's hours together, right? In, we experience our own needs and our own interests as they're bound up and interwoven into the needs and interests of those around us. So to sum it up, that humility, it, it's a verb in this sense, right? It's not a noun, but it's a verb that has us actively engaging in self-reflection so that we have an accurate view of our understanding of ourself and that that understanding is in the context of the world and that when we realize these connections, we are grounded, our actions are grounded in empathy, compassion, and respect. Again, that's really important. Now, with this idea of humility in mind, let's turn to this idea of cultural humility. So again, after much research and reading and putting all the different things that I learned from different authors, I've kind of put together in a nutshell this definition of cultural humility that has three parts. The first part, that cultural humility is a process that requires humility as individuals continually engage in self-reflection and self-critique as lifelong learners and reflective practitioners. Now, one thing here, you can see this theme of self-reflection. This question, you remember at the very beginning, I said, who are we and who do we wanna be? If we don't know that, it's really hard to go to the next step, right? So again, cultural humility is a process. So that means it's an ongoing process. It's not a one and done. It's something we continually engage in daily, weekly, annually, right? It's something you're always doing. This process begins with this self-examination, right? And lifelong learners, again, lifelong meaning we're doing it all the time. Reflective practitioners, that means we're reflecting, we're thinking, but then we're gonna practice, right? So our practice and our actions are related to our thinking and how we, what we've thought through. Secondly, 
Cultural humility is a process that requires humility by those in power to check the power imbalances in relationships, both individually and in groups, and to work to equalize them. So it's not enough to notice, oh yeah, there's a power imbalance here. You have to then take the next step to work to equalize them. So that again, we're looking back to that idea of we're all equal, right? We're all working together. Third, cultural humility is a process that requires humility to develop and maintain mutually respectful and dynamic partnerships, right? Again, both with communities and with individuals. Mutually respectful, that we're gonna respect other people, other lives. And some people, you know, in the United States or the world, we have this, these groups called deep ecologists, people who look at humans as being valuable, but then they'll extend it to life, to all life, right? In India, we have the tradition of Jainism, Right, where that jiva is infused into all life. And there's that idea of there's mutual respect and, and um, honor and value right, to all life. Dynamic, again, ever evolving process. So when we look at cultural humility, there are some assumptions that we can see that are there. One is this idea that all humans are equal. Right? All humans have equal value. It's kind of an essentialist argument. You're human, you're valuable. Now, again, there are groups that would extend this, right? To be all life. Secondly, all humans are diverse, right? We're diverse in many ways. And yet at the same time, we're part of a global community. So we have our individuality, but we're still connected to a whole nother culture and people. Third, that within humanity and there's, cultural differences and that's normal and that's to be expected part of life the question is how are we going to navigate those differences and third that humans are lifelong learners or i argue that they ought to be lifelong learners i'm sure we've all met people that think they know it all right and they've already arrived and that's unfortunate right because there's many things to learn and many always new things to learn i, I walk into a room of first graders and i don't assume i know it all because that's some first graders are gonna have experiences I don't know. And so I have to be open to learning to that all the time from everyone. So when we look at this, we see how these assumptions overlap with what we talked about with Sarvadaya. And it's that idea of, we have the, the overlap with the equality of all humanity, right? And this gets to the heart of who counts. Again, who are we gonna consider when we're making decisions? whose needs, whose desires, whose lives. Secondly, is that teaching of Satyagraha, a nonviolent insistence on truth through love. And then finally, this attitude of humility. So let's take these ideas and let's look at how these principles of cultural humility and sarvodaya might influence decisions we make. For today, let's look at particular issues related to COVID-19. Now, you know, this is a screenshot I took from this morning. You know, as of this morning, 117 million, 117.2 million people have contracted COVID and we've had 2.6 million people die globally, right? So this is a huge issue that's affecting the entire world. And there are countless issues and decisions that need to be made regarding this global pandemic. But of all the issues, let's focus on examining the type of decisions we make regarding the distribution of the vaccine. So now let's back up for a minute. When we think about COVID, what were the things that we were told or are being told still in terms of how to stop the spread of the disease? Right, so we have to socially distance, keep six feet or two meters apart. We should be wearing masks. Right, we should be washing our hands and then get vaccinated when we can. Now, I have total control over my life. Right? I live in a house, I have a housemate. In the last year, we've only had two other people enter this house. I can control when I go shopping, I can control where I go. I have a high degree control, a high degree of control over my contacts with others. Now, let's contrast that. So let's see that in comparison to the lives of people who live in prison. 
Now, when I'm talking about the prison system, I'm only looking at that in the United States. I, I have no idea what happens in India, although I suspect it's not too different in the sense of how people are treated. So how much control do prisoners have over their ability to socially distance? At least in the United States, our prisons are overpopulated, right? And there's too many people in the rooms that they have. So they're overcrowded. They don't have the ability to choose to be socially distant. Consider their access to PPE, right? Personal protective equipment, masks, gowns, gloves. They don't have those, right? I mean, somebody was telling me that they, when somebody enters a jail, they're given one mask and said, that's it. And that's what they have for their entire time there. They don't have a choice. They can't choose other things if they want. Think about sanitation as they go from their cell out to the to mess hall to where they eat, to the kitchen or the cafeteria, they don't have control over how they can keep their area clean. Consider also who comes into their space and the way that people come into their space. They don't have control over that. The jailer, right? They may or may not wear the masks. A, a guard might come in and not wear a mask. What is a prisoner gonna do, right? And somebody was telling me that a, a guard was going from one area that was the COVID positive part of the jail to the COVID negative, didn't wash his hands, you know, didn't change his, his gloves, didn't change his mask. So think about, think about that. Prisoners are an incredibly vulnerable population. They don't have a lot of choice. Now add to that the fact that when people are in prison, the infection rate for COVID-19 is four times higher and twice as deadly, two times as deadly if you're in prison as it is in the general population. Also, um, Charles Lee, Dr. Charles Lee, he's the president-elect of the American College of Correctional Physicians. He says that people in jail, prisoners, have a physiological and medical ages that are 15 years older than those in the general population. So if I'm in jail and I have a 20 year sentence and I'm 50 right now, by what he's saying, I'm really 65. And think about the ages and the distribution of, of the vaccine and how that comes into play. And again, I'm, I'm only focusing on um, the US prisons. So keep in mind how vulnerable these prisoners are. And then remember the principles of cultural humility and sarvodaya. Keep those principles in the back of your mind. Of all the issues in the context of COVID-19 in prisons or prisoners, I want us to consider this distribution of vaccines, so distributing the vaccines. It's something that's still in short supply. Right? We don't have enough vaccines for the population that we have in the United States or the world, right? There's, they haven't made enough yet. But consider that. See, think about what, what the implications are with this. Again, remember that prisoners are the most, not most, they are incredibly vulnerable and they don't have a lot of choice and keep the principles of cultural humility and sarvodaya in the back of your mind as we proceed. So, Back in October in the United States, different states were submitting their plans for distribution of the vaccine. In that first draft, only four states explicitly included prisoners in phase one priority. Only four. Okay, then um, a lot of people complained there was an outcry, so changes were made. And then 25 of the 50 states in the United States included prisoners in phase one. But then there was a backlash. In two of the states, there was a conservative leaders got, up, got all upset and made a, lot of, made a lot of noise and complained so that the, the states reversed their decisions and took the prisoners off of the priority one list because of the complaints. Now, Wanda um, Bertram, she is part of the Prison Policy Initiative. She explains this reversal by saying, unfortunately, it shows that lawmakers and politicians all across the political spectrum still feel like they have something to prove when it comes to denying basic human rights to people who've been convicted of crimes. Think about what that's saying. 
right? Keep that in mind. Now, let's look at Iowa. Iowa is the state that I live in right now, right? Even though prisoners are part of the most vulnerable population and have no control over their surroundings or minimal control, Iowa has placed prisoners in tier five. So they don't get it till everybody else has gotten it already. Now, in the United States, each state decides how they're going to prioritize the rollout of the vaccines. So Iowa puts prisoners at the very back, even though they're really, really, really um, needed to have or vulnerable. Maryland, however, is another state who they were looking at it and they put prisoners in the first phase. So in Maryland, most of the prisoners are probably already vaccinated by now, right? Now, think about this. What are the implications, right? Which states are reflecting the principles of sarodaya and cultural humility? Where do you see a genuine commitment to the equality of all humanity? Just because someone is in jail, does not mean that they are unworthy or less deserving of living. Put another way, what does it say about us, about society? If we think just because someone is in jail, they deserve to get COVID, they deserve to suffer from that or to even die from that. You can see how the lives of prisoners are being valued differently by these two states. But keep in mind, it's not just the prisoners. In Iowa, the largest hotspots of outbreaks of infection in the general public are in towns where the prisons are. So the prisoners' needs are connected to the families, to the friends, and all those who work in the jails, right? There's an interconnection there. Think back to what we said about humility allows us to see ourselves in context of the world around us, of the community around us. When we consider the framework of cultural humility and sarvadaya and our well-being as well as others and how they are interrelated, we will see that the most ethical response to the dis distribution of vaccines and to any of our actions ought to be one of empathy, compassion, and respect. So a few concluding reflections. Religious studies and ethics are important fields of study that have very practical implications to how we live. By applying principles and frameworks of cultural humility and sarvodaya, you, you've seen an example of how the discipline of religious studies and ethics can intersect with criminal justice, with science, Right, those are different fields that are intersecting. You've also seen an example of how ideas originating from different sides of the globe, you know, sarvodaya in India and cultural humility in the United States could overlap in their emphasis, right, in the importance that they're placing on the idea of the equality of all humanity, of satyagraha, and of humility. So I thought I would include this here. It's a very selected, limited bibliography so that if any of you are interested, you could look up some of this stuff. Um, some of it's online. And if you wanna explore some of these different ideas, you, you have the opportunity to do that. Thank you very much. And I hope um, this has contributed to your understanding of ways that we can have interdisciplinary research in this time of COVID. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your lecture on Vinoba Bhave, Sarvodaya, and Cultural Humility, Religious Studies and Ethics. And now, the third speaker is Dr. Niranjan Kaur Khalsa Baker. Let me introduce the speaker. She has a PhD from Asian Languages and Cultures, University of Michigan. Her research and teaching interests include religion, South Asia, diaspora, music, Indian philosophy, yoga, and more. She has taught Sikhism, Jainism, Kirtan, and yoga in USA, UK, and India. She has extensively published in Sikh religion, culture, and theory, and has received numerous fellowships and awards. She is the first female exponent of 
Sikh percussion tradition and she released her first album when she was only 17. This is Dr. Nirinjan Kaur Khalsa Baker and she will speak on teaching Sikhism and Jainism, ethnographic and engaged learning approaches to religious studies. Jajanendra, Satsiri Kal, Namaskar. I'm so happy to be with you all now. And I want to thank Tuljaram Chaturchand College for organizing this webinar on the importance of interdisciplinary research in the midst of COVID. My name is Naranjan Kar Khalsa, and I'm going to be speaking with you about teaching Sikhism and Jainism ethnographic and engaged learning approaches to religious studies. I am a senior instructor in theological studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. This is a private Catholic Jesuit in Marymount University and I was first hired as a clinical professor of Sikhism and Jainism. It was a position that was organized and funded by the Sikh and Jain communities to bring these two traditions into dialogue with one another. And so today I'm going to be talking about how I um, developed uh, teaching these courses at this university. I was raised a Sikh. My parents became Sikhs in the early 70s. Um, this was some of the first times that people outside of Punjab were adopting the Sikh religion. And I grew up um, practicing and wearing a turban and bana. And um, our community also has practices of kundalini yoga. So this is how I was raised. And in college, I started learning the Sikh percussion tradition, the Amritsari Kapurtala Paj, on uh, the Jordi Pakavaj. So this Jordi that you see here in this image um, is said to be um, the Jordi was developed uh, by Guru Arjan Dev, the fifth Sikh Guru. Um, he, it's said that he took the Pakavaj and he split it in half and stood it upright. So the bowls that we play are open-handed. We use Atta, just like the Pakavaj. Um, and the bowls, though, come from the um, Amritsar and Kapurtala Baj. And so being able to study this tradition was very meaningful for me. I learned from a 13th generation exponent by Waldeep Singh. Um, and he, his family had been doing kirtan since the time of Guru Arjan Dave, the fifth Sikh Guru. And their family had been six since the time of um, Guru Nanak. So the Gurbani Kirtan Parampara is something that I was practicing. I became a student in 2000, and I decided to go back to um, university and get my PhD, um, studying and helping to document and analyze this tradition. So because music um, is something that has to be practiced to be learned. It is an oral tradition that um, is oral knowledge, both oral that you hear and oral that you speak, that you share, that's passed down from generation to generation. To um, learn it, you have to embody that knowledge. And it's this type of intangible knowledge that requires um, a type of engaged research. The ethnographic research was being able to uh, be both a participant and an observer. So um, through graduate studies, learning how to see, how to interpret, how to analyze um, and write about what I was experiencing. I engaged in um, interviews um, of old memory bearers. 
So being able to capture this oral knowledge, this intangible knowledge, and um, write about it was part of that ethnographic research work that I did. So I interviewed um, many scholars and musicians who um, understood the change of Sikh Kirtan over time, how it had been practiced in the pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial eras. So my dissertation on the Renaissance of Sikh devotional music, memory, identity, and orthopraxy um, had, you know, this wealth of um, ethnographic data that I had collected, these, these interviews that I had done. Um, and it was partially funded by a Fulbright Fellowship. I was able to go to India and work with Punjabi University Patiala and the Gurmat Sangeet department there and um, engage in this work. So through the work, what I realized is that the Kirtan had changed over time. And by Gurcharan Singh, who you see sitting here, who's part of the Parampara, is the grand um, uncle of my teacher, by Baldeep Singh. He's a, an 11th generation exponent. He um, said that religion started suffering at the hands of politics. And we really see this through the politics of the colonial era and partition that happened in India. So during India colonization, um, we see the effects of colonization. And there's a scholar who wrote on this, Paulo Freire, in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He says, cultural conquest leads to the cultural inauthenticity of those who are invaded. They begin to respond to the values, the standards, and the goals of the invaders. And so, um, you know, having to take on the perspectives of the invaders um, through the educational um, methods, through the English language, through the Christian missionaries, is something that um, also affected the arts, the culture, the language, um, and the and how, um, in the case of Sikhi and the other Indian religions, how they were being interpreted and reinterpreted um, within India itself. The partition also played a really large role in, um, you know, in losing some of that knowledge. So the Muslim Rababis had been a central um, part of the Sikh tradition. The first Sikh Guru, Guru Nanak, is always seen with his accompanist by Mardana playing the Rabab. And the, there was a tradition of these Rababis that would sing Sikh Kirtan in the Darbars of the Sikh Gurus. But during partition, when Pakistan was made, the Muslim Rababis were made to go um, over to Pakistan, and a great deal of that knowledge, again, was lost. And each generation, the knowledge has to be passed down and remembered, or else it becomes lost. This is the problem um, that happens. So the my effort was to help to understand what caused the loss of this knowledge, um, what did survive, and how um, we could understand the changes of music within the Sikh tradition as a lens through which to see changes in Sikh identity as well. So now um, there are these newer, more modern instruments that were added. Um, we normally see Sikh Kirtan being played with the harmonium, the vaja, um, the tabla, and um, these are newer instruments that came about. 
And so for me, it was interesting to think, how was Kirtan sung before? It was sung in rag melody. It was sung in the drupad form. Um, it was also sung in folk styles as well. But it has these roots in drupad. It has these roots in the more classical um, forms. And so trying to understand how they were lost and why was a big part of my research. So that was what then brought me to, um, that was my dissertation, my PhD research, and then I came to teach at Loyola Marymount University in the Theological Studies Department. And I began teaching courses on Sikhism, Warrior Saints, Hinduism, Jainism, Yoga, and also other courses on yoga philosophy, sacred music, um, general courses about how to live in the world. Um, and what religion means for the ways in which we live, including courses such as In Search of a Way, God and the Human Experience, and then also taking these approaches to comparative theology and comparative mysticism that are not using a dominant um, Christian lens through which to view other religions, but instead understanding comparative theology as the practice of doing of engaging in religion, engaging in deep dialogue and conversations. And through that engagement, um, we come to deepen our understanding of others and to under deepen our understanding of ourselves. So these are the classes I teach and the approaches that I take in those classes. So teaching Jane and Sikh studies at LMU, as well as the other Dharma traditions, um, it really works with the focus of the university. Um, though it is a Catholic university, they honor the reality of religious pluralism and embrace interfaith dialogue because the desired outcome of these encounters moves us beyond tolerance to mutual respect and understanding. It deepens our appreciation of our own faith and it creates opportunities for engaging with others who share a longing for meaningful lives. So this key idea about moving beyond tolerance towards mutual respect and understanding is really the goal of engaging in religious studies, theological studies, is to be able to understand those who may be different from you and be able to um, really find common ground and a greater understanding of the diversity through with which um, and through which we live. So LMU's mission um, is that encouragement of learning, education of the whole person. So our intellectual thinking selves, but also our emotional selves, our spiritual selves, our whole embodied self, how we live in the world. Um, and how we serve one another, and ultimately how we help to one another thrive. And so this idea of promotion of justice is another key component of the course. And so I take this mission and I am able to implement it into the courses that I teach. We always start um, each semester asking about our own worldview and why understanding how we see the world might be important for our topic of study. And so I ask students to think about facts that define who they are, it can be their faith, ethnic heritage, their gender, place of birth, residence, educational background, and um, we think about how these actually inform how we see the world, how we think about others in the world, how we interact, um, and whether they cause us to judge or stereotype, or if we have biases um, through which we relate to one another. So being able to bring these to consciousness and allow ourselves to be aware of them then allows us to um, really interact with one another in a real truthful way. And many of my students um, don't know much about the Indian religions. They may have gone to Catholic school. Um, in America, there's not a lot of 
um, education about the Indian religions until university. So um, even and and only if they take classes like the ones that we teach. So there's not a lot of exposure that students have. Um, so for them being able to recognize what their own stereotypes might be is really important. So I show them images and have them think critically and reflect um, about what they see and um, their thoughts. And then we're able to dialogue about it in class. And so we also talk about the limitation of terms. So, um, you know, if we're taking a, an American centric view, then which, so I, I talk to people who are, um, I kind of teach from a lens of people, students in America. We do have international students at the university as well, but I'm really trying to get American students to think beyond um, just their small centrism, their small frame through which they may be viewing the world. And so, you know, we ask um, from this map, you know, why might Eastern religion be a limitation? We might call um, Indian religions or can we be referred to as Eastern as opposed to Western. And here we're also creating a dichotomy. And um, we also see that the map, it's all relative to who and where we're talking about when we think about a globe. Um, so, and being able to see that um, the Indian religions, the people that, and the religion itself, they've migrated. They migrate and they've traveled through various cultures, various continents, various countries, um, languages. And so recognizing that there are, um, there's a great diaspora now, we're global. So not thinking um, only in, in the sense of origin or where religion may come from, but understanding that it's migrated and it's transnational now um, is a big part of rethinking our, the terminology we use and um, how we are seeing um, the, our topic of study. So Western religion is categories and colonization in the late 19th and early 20th century, Christian theologians, philosophers, and missionaries, they began to map, write, and translate Asian works using Western terminology and Western categories such as religion. Um, during this time of European imperialism and colonial expansion, Great Britain, Spain, and France, and others, ended up carving up parts of the world as their empire. So they encountered other cultures through their own Western categories, and they changed how those cultures viewed themselves. So this is that issue of colonization, is, is it's also changing and, and reinterpreting um, how the cultures just see themselves. The study of world religions came about in the university departments and they started to have new subjects, new ways of studying comparative religions. So as I said, I don't like to approach it from a dominant um, perspective of looking at, um, well, let's see what this dominant perspective says and then rate all others against it. But instead comparative religions, I approach it differently. But in the 1800s when it was coming about, it was from this more dominant perspective. Um, and the world religions approach of the 20th century, it categorized Western religions and Eastern religions, putting all of the Indian religions into the other category and saying Western religions were Christianity and Judaism, but then Islam is always falling, kind of, it gets lost along the way. Um, it is an Abrahamic tradition, but um, it's also, that's why I have it in parentheses there, is, is sometimes it can also be, um, uh, it, it, it might not be incorporated into um, what they call Western religion. And, and so thinking about, you know, trying to unpack the issues there as well is something that we do in class. So when we think about approaches to religion, 
They did come about during this time of the Age of Enlightenment, the scientific reasoning and categorization of cultures of religion so that they could be colonized. So this, this kind of carving up um, and, and looking at and categorizing and putting into neat little boxes um, was part of that project. The problem that gets created is it, it's starting to try to put labels and terms on things that are very um, diverse. Um, it tries to essentialize difference and it becomes too reductionist. It doesn't allow for the nuance or the diversity within the within the own their practices and the tradition itself. So what's getting lost? So going back to my PhD research, that's what I was looking at. What gets lost along the way when we're translating and and um, and and trying to categorize and standardize um, new forms of music um, or old forms. What gets lost when we do that? So postmodern approaches are non-reductive. They allow for difference. Um, the central focus has shifted more towards diversity versus looking at these overarching laws, um, looking at private realm, not only what happens in the public realm, but also what happens in the private realm, thinking about our own subjectivity, our own positionality, um, our own identity in ways that we show up rather than just looking at religion as objects. Um, as scientific objects, as external things to study, really internally investigating. So experiential knowledge goes with that, rather than only book learning, understanding that experience teaches us a lot, and that it's about daily spiritual experience. When we think about religion, it's not just segregated or partitioned, um, or this idea of secularized of, of the secular where it's um, separate, where religion is separated from the everyday, but actually thinking about how religion informs our everyday practices, our business dealings, um, our relationships with one another, that our belief systems um, are integral to the way that we show up and act in the world. So this is how I approach um, the Dharma traditions, thinking about the Dharma discourses, reorienting students' perspectives and assumptions, and allowing the Indian traditions to speak in their own terms. Um, so rather than using the term religion, we use the term Dharma um, uh, in terms like anekantavada, the multiple perspectives, uh, multi-sidedness. Um, through which we can see the world and doing engaged learning. So that experiential learning, understanding how our habitus, our background informs how we live in the world and really doing engaged practices. So when I teach uh, my class on Sikhism warrior saints, we, um, the students, you know, if we're speaking to an American audience, um, there was a survey that was done and in 2015 by the National Survey by the Heart Research Associates. And they found that only 11% of Americans have a close friend or acquaintance that is a sick. 31% have never seen or interacted with a sick person. 60% admit to knowing little to nothing about sick Americans. And 95% have never heard of Guru Nanak. So because of this, um, there have been many hate crimes um, against Sikhs, um, seeing them as terrorists, particularly since 9-11. And I now teach um, this woman, Valerie Carr, um, her book that she wrote. It just came out this summer, so this year I've been teaching it, about how do we see no stranger? So when we continue to see violence against marginalized communities, um, how are we able to use the teachings of the Sikh Gurus as a way to really show up with love? How can the ethic of love be revolutionary? Um, love for our opponents, love for others, love for ourselves. And she herself was a lawyer and a filmmaker, and an activist and so being able to um, share with students you know how um, 
unjust social institutions, as it says here, can be reimagined through the ways in which we see the world is um, an approach that I like to share. So thinking about current issues, current events, how politics and religion are not separate, they go hand in hand. Um, the Sikh Gurus talk about the midi and the pity, the spiritual and the temporal, um, that they're both part of this um, lived experience. And so Sikhs being seen as terrorists, being lots of hate crimes happening, being told to go back to their country where they may be born in America and have no other country um, through, of, through from where they were born. Um, so the current events is really central to also bringing students into thinking about how religion shapes our everyday and the political sphere. And so doing engaged learning practices, doing experiential learning where we use our senses, we immerse and attend, we immerse in the religion, um, the they go to the Jane Munder here uh, of, of um, Southern California. They go to Gurdwaras. They do service learning. They do seva. Um, and they're able to interact with practitioners and do interviews and, and so deepen their own knowledge by seeing, by being also participant observers, just as part of the ethnographic method. So they do seva, they go to Gurdwara, they may read from the Sikh scripture, the Guru Granth Sahib, they may do Nam Simran practice, um, meditation practices to really deepen their engagement. They may serve um, food to the homeless through the Khalsa Peace Corps, which is a food truck that um, drives around, you make food on it, and then you go and serve the homeless around Los Angeles. So they do the seva as well, being engaged in their local communities. We have guest speakers come in who are able to share different aspects of Sikhi, looking at the Jukji, um, Professor Karen Leonard here in the middle, Karen Leonard, she has done a lot of work with um, looking at um, six, from the you know early 1900s here in America, here in California, even uh, marrying Mexican women and the uh, this um, intercultural kind of interaction, this history of six in America and California, and um, having others talk about what it means to be a warrior saint. So having students able to learn from guest speakers is part of that as well. Um, so the classes I teach, I teach about 90 students a semester. Each class will have about 30 students in it. And um, students find that they have a better grasp of understanding who six are, um, that they'll share what they learn about their tradition with other others. So their cultural literacy and religious literacy is also something they're able to teach others and, and, and share that knowledge, which um, the idea is also to be able to recognize who six are and um, not not um, be afraid if they see the turban, not think of terrorism, but actually understand that the sick wearing of the turban is about a commitment to um, freedom, a commitment to religious freedom, to serving others, to um, using that ethic of love to respond to respond with love that revolutionary love that that the students learn about in the course and so students say that they really like learning about other religions because maybe they only went to a catholic school before and that's all they've ever known so they're exposed to new um cultures new ways of seeing the world new being new ways of being in the world Um, that it's good to take classes like this because you get to understand other cultures a lot better. So again, when they're going into the workforce, um, intercultural knowledge is really important and sensitivity. And for them to have this exposure is, um, helps them, helps them after the university, after this class as well, helps them with their peers, with one another. And so they enjoy 
um, this approach to learning about religion. And they're able to also process these experiences then. They reflect about it in journals, so through writing. So they have the experiences, they reflect about it. They're able to analyze it, this critical analysis that happens in their research papers. So they learn about the history. They learn about, we do scriptural reading. Um, they learn about the philosophy. But then also this engagement, this overall engagement is the overall approach that I take to learning about these things. And they're able to synthesize all of that together in their final papers, in their presentations, and then also even in their life after class. So teaching about Jainism and Sikhism was interesting because Jainism about ahimsa, live and let live, Sikhism helping others to live um, is one of those um, interesting ways to bring these two traditions together and seeing that there's a Jain Mandir in Patna Sahib, right next to the Sri Tukit Har, Har Mandir um, there in Bihar, and that it was a Jain family that um, helped to take care of the 10th Guru, Guru Gobind Singh's family um, when they were there and gave the land for this, this um, Gurdwara to be built there. So seeing the confluence of these traditions was part of the teaching that I did and thinking about being spiritual warriors, how we show up in the world, how we battle our own inner vices. So thinking about both violence and nonviolence and what that means to um, only draw the sword within the Sikh tradition, it's only drawing it when all other means have failed. So it's about um, being a spiritual warrior or a warrior saint, a Sant Sapai. How do we battle our own inner demons of calm, crowed, lobe, mo, ahankar, of lust, anger, greed, attachment, and pride? And by, you know, um, looking and ridding ourselves and battling these vices, then we can help to defend others, protect others, serve others, and really fight for that justice um, so that all, all can have um, peace and equality. Um, and it's through that ethic of love then that I teach this. And so Jainism, they also, um, you know, students, about 30 students per class, they also will share what they know with others. They would recommend it to others. They feel like they really get a better sense of who Jains are from the class. They go to the Jain Center of Southern California. Um, they may engage in the five vows. So um, ahimsa, satya, asteya, brahmacharya, aparigraha, they'll find their own ways to do these practices. So they might choose to be vegetarian. Um, for this a period of time, or vegan, or um, for non-stealing, maybe they'll be aware of their energy consumption and the resources that they're using. Um, for brahmacharya, how do they find moderation or a parigraha, non-attachment, and maybe they'll try to be non-attached to social media, or um, which is not looking at their deleting it off of their phones or. Um, being not attached to their phones. So things that can help serve them. So they're able to engage with these ideas in a way that makes sense to them. Um, some students also, we take them to India. Um, this is more for the graduate programs, but for undergrads, um, one undergrad went with us when we all went um, into this Jane studies program and they find it um, interesting to learn about a different perspective of the world. So they're changing how they see um, the world. They learn a lot. Um, and also some of them never knew that these religions even existed. Um, so they're learning about a, a whole group of people um, that they weren't exposed to before. They learn about philosophical ethics and they enjoy that. Um, and they think about how they may be causing harm. Um, being aware of the ways that they may cause harm, that they might not be aware of eating meat as being harmful, um, harmful to animals, harmful to the environment. And so they're able to get this perspective. It's eye opening um, and they, it may be new, 
but they take the time and they learn a lot. So in conclusion, um, this type of student-centered learning, um, there's been studies that show that retention, that you're able to remember and retain this information if you most if you're able to teach it to others, but next is by doing, by practicing, um, by discussing it. Um, and it's through this sensory learning that um, students can take what they learn and integrate it into their lives and it stays with them after the class. It stays with them after the university. It's not just um, mugging up just uh, facts or figures. Um, here in this pyramid, it says that lectures and reading, students don't remember that much from lectures or readings, but they remember it when they're doing, when they're engaged, when they're experiencing. And so this approach really helps them um, integrate holistically um, this information into their lives. And it's a value to employers who endorse educational practices that involve students in active, effortful work, including community engagements. Um, they, like, they like it when people are able to demonstrate an ability to think critically, communicate clearly, solve complex problems, um, and that that's more important than a major that you may graduate with that they want to hire people who have ethical ju judgment and integrity, intercultural skills and capacity for continually learning. So this engaged learning approach allows for um, that type of intercultural skills and um, religious studies allows for us to think about how we act ethically in the world with integrity. And so, being able to really apply this knowledge in real world settings is is the key so that is my presentation on these approaches i want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this presentation thank you Thank you, ma'am, for speaking on theology and religion, on the value of interdisciplinary research and critical thinking in humanities and social sciences. Now, I would like to propose a vote of thanks for today's session. I thank Dr. Mukdha Yevlekar for speaking on what is religious studies, relevance of religious studies in humanities and social sciences. I thank Dr. Swasti Bhattacharya for speaking on Vinoba Bhave, Sarvodaya and Cultural Humility, Religious Studies and Ethics. I thank Dr. Nirinjan Kaur Khalsa Baker for speaking on Teaching Sikhism and Jainism, Ethnographic and Engaged Learning Approaches to Religious Studies. And I thank Dr. Margaret Marion Gover for speaking on Theology and Religion, on the value of interdisciplinary research and critical thinking in humanities and social sciences. And with this, I declare this session as over. Thank you.